Welcome back, everyone, to The Deep Dive. You know, sometimes I feel like we get so caught up in labels and diagnoses that things can get pretty murky. Mm -hmm. So today, let's clear up some of the confusion around two states that often get kind of muddled up. Artistic shutdown and catatonia. Yeah, and those can definitely look pretty similar, uh, especially to someone who's maybe not super familiar with all the nuances of the autism spectrum. <laughs> exactly. And to help us dive deep, our source material today is a blog post. It's titled Autistic Shutdown versus Catatonia, Understanding the Difference. Oh, okay. And it's from a website called Cheap ABA, which you know specializes in autism information. Gotcha. So think of this deep dive as your cheat sheet to really understanding what these two states are all about. Yeah, the key is that both can involve a person, you know, becoming unresponsive. Right. But the reasons why, how long it lasts, and the uh, the overall intensity, totally different ball games. Okay, so let's break it down. Okay. Starting with autistic shutdown. What exactly are we talking about here? Well, imagine this. You're at a concert, music's blasting, lights are flashing, the crowd's pushing and shoving. Sensory overload, right? Right. And for many autistic individuals, that feeling can be amplified like tenfold. And that's where a shutdown comes in. It's almost like the brain's hitting the emergency brake. Exactly. Because it can't process all that incoming information. The blog post describes it as this feeling of complete overwhelm, like the body and mind are just shutting down to cope. And it's important to remember, this isn't a choice. Right. It's an involuntary reaction to really intense stress. So it's not like someone being difficult or trying to get attention. It's their system literally saying overload. Exactly. Okay. And while it can be really debilitating for the person experiencing it, you said it's usually temporary, right? It, right. Exactly. Okay, good. But how would you actually recognize shutdown in another person? Like, what would be the signs? Well, you might see someone suddenly withdraw from a situation. Okay. Or stop responding to questions or, like, struggling to communicate. Mm -hmm. Imagine, like, you're talking to someone and they just suddenly become quiet, their eyes glaze over, and they kind of disappear into themselves. Right. That could very well be a shutdown happening. So if you're with someone and they seem to suddenly zone out, it might not be intentional. They could be experiencing this shutdown. Right. And the best approach is patience and understanding. Absolutely. With a little bit of time and, you know, the right support, the person can usually recover from a shutdown and get back to, you know, their usual self. Okay. Think of it like rebooting a computer after it freezes. Sometimes you just need a little time to reset, right? Makes sense. All right. So let's switch gears a bit and talk about catatonia. Okay. What makes this different from shutdown? Well, if shutdown is like hitting the pause button, catatonia is more like the whole system crashing. It's much more serious, um, a much more complex neuropsychiatric condition. And the unresponsiveness we see is like way more intense and it lasts much longer. That sounds really scary. What actually causes it? Is it something that only happens to autistic individuals? That's a great question. And this is where it gets really interesting. Okay. While catatonia can be a symptom of autism, it's not exclusive to it. Okay. It can actually show up in a whole bunch of different conditions, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, even major depressive disorder. So it's more like a symptom that can have many different root causes. Exactly. It's not just an autism thing. Got it. And because it can be linked to so many different things, it's... Uh, it's really important to distinguish it from autistic shutdown, right? Right. Because the potential consequences of, like, misinterpreting the two can be pretty serious. Okay, I'm starting to see the distinction here, but can we make this even clearer? Sure. Can you give some specific examples of, like, how catatonia might look different from shutdown? Okay. Imagine someone staying completely motionless, almost, like, frozen in place for hours on end. No reaction to anything around them. Oh, wow. Or, like refusing to eat, drink, or sleep, despite, you know, obviously needing to, those are red flags that go way beyond what we typically see in a shutdown. So it's not just zoning out for a little bit. It's this, like, prolonged, severe unresponsiveness. Exactly. And sometimes catatonia can even manifest as, like, really intense anxiety, agitation, even aggression. Okay. And in some cases, there might even be hallucinations or delusions present. Wow. Okay. Those are definitely not things you see with a typical shutdown, right? Nope. And recognizing these differences is super crucial because it completely changes how we approach supporting someone who's experiencing either of these states. Right. Misinterpreting catatonia as a simple shutdown could have some really serious consequences. Okay. So we've got these two states. 
both involve unresponsiveness, but with some key differences. Mm -hmm. Can we break down those differences, like even further, maybe like a comparison checklist or something? Absolutely. One of the biggest red flags is the duration. Yeah. Think of shutdown as a, you know, relatively short term response lasting minutes to hours. Okay. Catatonia, on the other hand, can stretch on for days, weeks, or even months in really severe cases. Wow. That's a, that's a huge difference. So if someone's unresponsive for a long period of time, that's like a definite sign to consider catatonia. Right. Another big one is triggers. Remember how we talked about shutdown often being linked to a specific event or like sensory overload? Mm -hmm. Well, catatonia is a lot more complex. It could be sparked by anything from medication side effects, underlying medical conditions, even past trauma. It's much harder to pinpoint a direct cause. So with shutdown, you can often like pinpoint the trigger. Usually Like it's... a loud noise or social pressure. Yeah. But with catatonia, it's more of a mystery to kind of unravel. Exactly. And finally, pay close attention to the person's response to stimuli. You know, in a shutdown, there might still be subtle reactions to uh, to gentle comfort, like a favorite object, a familiar voice, a reassuring touch. But with catatonia, it's like nothing gets through. Often, yeah. You might see very little response or even no response at all, even to things that would normally be calming or comforting to that individual. It's like a much deeper level of unresponsiveness. So if you try those like comforting things and there's absolutely no reaction, that's another sign it might be something more serious than shutdown. Right. And, you know, while these states are distinct, it's really important to remember that both of them require understanding and support. Right. Whether it's autistic shutdown or catatonia, the goal is to help that person feel safe and supported. Right. right? Absolutely. Yeah. So how can we do that? What are some practical steps for supporting someone who might be experiencing either of these? Well, creating a safe space is essential. Think of it as a quiet, comforting haven, a place where someone can retreat when they're feeling overwhelmed. Like a sensory friendly zone where they can kind of decompress without all that added stress. Exactly. And just as important is communication. If you know your triggers for shutdowns or catatonia, be sure to communicate those to your loved ones or like caregivers. This empowers them to offer the right kind of support. So it's not just on the people around them to like figure it out, mm -hmm. the individual can be an advocate for their own needs. Precisely. Yeah. And of course, you know, these situations can be tricky. If shutdowns or periods of unresponsiveness are frequent or really intense, seeking professional help is crucial. Okay. A mental health professional or a doctor can really assess the situation and guide you towards the best support. Yeah, sometimes you just need that expert help to navigate these challenges, right? Yeah. And while professional help is essential, what about things that individuals can do themselves too, like manage these episodes? Well, that's where self-care comes in. Engaging in activities that you find enjoyable, calming, relaxing, that can be super beneficial. Think mm -hmm. about things that help you de-stress and recharge. Listening to music, spending time in nature, practicing mindfulness, right. whatever works for you. So it's not just about managing the episodes themselves. It's also about building resilience and coping mechanisms yeah. to like reduce how often they happen and how intense they are. Exactly. And that brings us to a really crucial point. Okay. Understanding the difference between autistic shutdown and catatonia isn't just about like book knowledge. It's about knowing how to best support ourselves and the others who might be experiencing these states, you know? Yeah. It's about having the tools to respond with compassion and understanding rather than judgment or frustration. Yeah, I'm really seeing how this knowledge can be really empowering both for individuals on the spectrum and for those who care about them. It's about building a more informed and supportive community. Absolutely. And it leads us to a really crucial question for all of you listening. All right, hit us with that thought-provoking question. What's the big takeaway you want our listeners to ponder? Well, think about this. Both shutdown and catatonia, they can easily be mistaken for something else entirely. Sometimes people might see it as like uncooperativeness or defiance, even laziness. Oh, yeah, I can definitely see that. It's easy to jump to those conclusions when you don't really know what's going on, right? I bet that must be really frustrating for the person experiencing it, too. Oh, absolutely. So the question we need to ask ourselves is this. How does understanding these two states, shutdown and catatonia, change how we approach supporting autistic individuals? You know, Especially when they seem unresponsive or they're displaying behaviors that you know we might misunderstand. Right. How can we shift our perspective? Well, it really challenges us to look beyond just like the surface behavior, right? Yeah. And think about what might be going on underneath. 
It's about remembering that there's a reason behind every action, even if we don't understand it right away. So instead of assuming someone is being difficult, we should be asking ourselves, could this be a sign of shutdown or, you know, maybe even catatonia? It's about approaching the situation with empathy and curiosity. Exactly. Instead of jumping to conclusions, let's try to understand that individual's experience. Remember, what looks like defiance or laziness on the outside could actually be like an internal struggle to cope with overwhelming sensations or emotions. Yeah. And that leads us to the importance of creating a supportive environment. Mm. If you know someone who's you know, prone to shutdowns or catatonic episodes, being mindful of their triggers is so crucial. Absolutely. Think about it. For someone who's like easily overstimulated, a crowded shopping mall can feel like a full-blown assault on the senses, you know? Right. It's not just about being quote-unquote sensitive. It's about recognizing that their sensory experience is genuinely different from someone who's not on the spectrum. So, like, practical things right. like avoiding sensory overload, respecting their need for quiet time, being patient with their communication style. Mm -hmm. Those can all make a huge difference. Absolutely. And even, you know, small adjustments to the environment can have a huge impact. Right. Something as simple as dimming the lights or turning down the music can create a more calming atmosphere. Mm. It's about being proactive and anticipating those potential triggers. What about communication? How can we communicate effectively with someone during a shutdown or a catatonic episode? Well, that's where patience comes in and observation, too. Remember, communication isn't just about words. It's about paying attention to like those nonverbal cues. Yeah. Body language, facial expressions. Right. Even if someone isn't verbally responsive, they might still be communicating through other means. So it's about being attuned to those subtle signals and responding accordingly. Exactly. And sometimes, honestly, the most helpful thing you can do is just be present. Huh. Offer reassurance. Let that person know that you're there for them, even if they can't respond in the way that you expect. It's about providing that sense of safety and understanding without forcing interaction. You got it. And of course, it's always important to seek professional help if shutdowns or catatonic episodes are frequent or severe. A mental health professional can help identify any potential underlying causes, develop coping strategies, and provide appropriate support. So, you know, recognizing when a situation needs that expert intervention. Precisely. But ultimately, it all comes down to this. Supporting someone with autism, whether they're experiencing shutdown or catatonia, it requires a shift in perspective. It's about recognizing that their experience of the world is unique and valid and responding with empathy and understanding. It's about meeting them where they are and providing the support they need to navigate those challenging moments. Exactly. And that brings us to, you know, another really crucial point. OK. It's not enough to simply understand the differences between autistic shutdown and catatonia. We need to take that knowledge and actually turn it into action, you know. So what can we do? as individuals and as a society to really make a difference in the lives of autistic people. Well, for starters, let's challenge those harmful misconceptions that lead to, you know, misinterpretations and judgment. If you see someone who seems withdrawn or unresponsive, don't just jump to conclusions about their character or their intentions. Right. Like, don't just assume they're being lazy or defiant or disrespectful. Right. There could be a totally different explanation like a shutdown or a catatonic episode that's driving their behavior. Exactly. Instead of resorting to judgment, let's approach these situations with curiosity and compassion. Ask yourself, what could be causing this behavior? How can I best support this person in this moment? So it's about, you know, replacing blame with understanding, assumptions with genuine inquiry. Absolutely. And remember, creating a supportive environment goes a long way in helping individuals with autism manage those you know, those challenging states. Be mindful of their triggers, respect their need for quiet time and sensory regulation, and be patient with their communication style. All those small adjustments can make a world of difference. You're right. And, you know, if you're unsure about how to best support someone, don't be afraid to ask. Yeah. Open communication is key. Simply saying, hey, I want to be supportive. Is there anything I can do? That can go a long way. It's about showing that you care and that you're willing to learn how to be a better ally. Exactly. And finally, you know, let's remember that advocating for systemic change is so crucial. We need to push for greater awareness and acceptance of neurodiversity in, you know, all aspects of society. Education, healthcare, employment, community spaces. So that means like 
fighting for inclusive policies and practices that recognize the unique needs and strengths of autistic individuals. Exactly. It's about creating a world where everyone, regardless of their neurotype, feels valued, respected, and empowered to thrive. Yeah, that's a vision worth fighting for. Absolutely. And it all starts with understanding. The more we learn about autism, the better equipped we are to create a world where everyone can truly be their authentic selves. This deep dive has been so insightful, and I feel like we've covered so much ground. You know, we've explored the nuances of autistic shutdown and catatonia, discussed the importance of empathy and understanding, and highlighted the need for both individual and systemic change. I agree. It's been a really thought-provoking conversation, and I hope our listeners are feeling, you know, empowered to apply this knowledge in their own lives and interactions. Me too. Before we wrap up, do you have any final thoughts or takeaways you'd like to leave our listeners with? I think, you know, the most important takeaway here is this. Even though autistic shutdown and catatonia are distinct experiences, they both underscore the importance of creating a world that is more inclusive and accommodating of neurodiversity. That's beautifully said. It's about, you know, recognizing and celebrating the unique ways that autistic individuals experience and interact with the world and creating spaces where everyone feels safe, supported, and empowered to be their authentic selves. Exactly. It's about recognizing that, you know, difference doesn't equal deficit. Right. It's about embracing the richness and diversity of human experience. This deep dive has been a powerful reminder that knowledge isn't just about accumulating facts. It's about using those facts to create a more just and compassionate world. Mm. It really does come down to that, doesn't it? Yeah. Recognizing our differences, that's what makes us human. Absolutely. And by embracing those differences, you know, we create a richer, more vibrant society for everyone. This deep dive has really given me a new perspective on, you know, autistic shutdown and catatonia. And I bet it has for our listeners, too. But knowledge is only powerful if we actually use it. Right. You're exactly right. We can't just file this information away. We need to let it inform our actions, our interactions, and really just our whole understanding of the autistic community. So where do we go from here? What are some like concrete steps we can take to apply what we've learned? Well, I think first and foremost, we need to be mindful of the language we use. You know, words have power. They can really shape how we see things. Let's move away from um, terms like difficult or defiant or lazy when we're describing behaviors that might actually be coming from, you know, shut down or catatonia. It's about choosing words that reflect empathy and understanding. Right, right? exactly. And remember, communication is a two-way street. If you're interacting with someone who's on the spectrum, don't be afraid to ask how you can best support them. Yeah, it's amazing how such a simple question like, what can I do to help, can make someone feel so seen and supported. It really can. And it opens up this dialogue, right, that allows for greater understanding and connection. What about, like, creating more sensory-friendly environments? That seems like a pretty practical step we can all take, whether we're at home, at work, or just out in the community. Absolutely. We can all do our part to create spaces that are less overwhelming, you know, for those with mm -hmm. sensory sensitivities. Think about things like dimming the lights, minimizing loud noises, you know, providing quiet areas where people can retreat if they need to. Even small changes can make a big difference. They really can. And, you know, on a larger scale, we need to advocate for policies that promote inclusivity and accessibility for autistic individuals. This means pushing for better educational resources, supportive workplaces, and a healthcare system that's, you know, truly responsive to the needs of the autistic community. It's about creating a society where everyone has the opportunity to thrive regardless of their neurotype. Exactly. And it all starts with awareness, understanding, and a willingness to actually make a difference. This deep dive has been a powerful reminder of the importance of, well, empathy, knowledge, and action. It's been a privilege to share these insights with you and our listeners. And to you as well. I feel like we've only just scratched the surface of this really complex and fascinating topic. Oh, we definitely have. But, you know, that's the beauty of learning, right? It's a lifelong journey. We encourage everyone to continue exploring this topic, deepening their understanding, and using that knowledge to create a more inclusive world for everyone. Well said. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive. Until next time, keep exploring, keep learning, and keep questioning the world around you. <laughs>